Kia ora koutou. welcome to this week's Ice Birds webinar presented by the Antarctic Science Platform. My name's Georgia Nelson and I'll be your host on behalf of the platform today. You're welcome to use the Q&A function or the chat box at the bottom of the screen to ask a question at any time. You can also upvote existing questions. All the questions will be moderated by myself and Richard and there'll be time for questions at the end of the presentation. I'm excited to welcome Victoria University of Wellington Associate Professor and GNS Principal Scientist Richard Levy to the webinar today. Richard is the Lead Principal Investigator for Project One, Antarctic Ice Dynamics. Thanks for joining us today, Richard. I'll let you take it from here. Thank, thanks, Georgia. <laughs> Kia ora koutou. I'm Katoa. And thanks to all of you um, people in Zoom land who have taken time to to um, listen in today. I'm um, just going to share my screen here. It's always a standard Zoom, Zoom start. All right, so what I'm going to do today is present to you all um, a bit of an overview of, of a key project um, that we're conducting within um, or, or a key project, a drilling project that we're conducting within the Antarctic Ice Dynamics Project within the Antarctic science platform. We were going to essentially, as the title suggests, drill through the Ross Ice Shelf back into uh, sediments beneath the seafloor to, to gain a, a picture of what West Antarctica, what the West Antarctic ice sheet might have been like um, in the past when, when Earth was warmer than it is today. Um, as part of this presentation, um, I'm going to walk you through the motivation for the project. Um, you know, what might a two degree world look like is essentially the primary motivation and, and why that's important will become relevant uh, or we become obvious in a couple of seconds. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about glacial cycles. Um, I realize that geologists, geoscientists, people that think about um, times prior to present generally have an idea about what glacial interglacial cycles are, but, but I also recognize there are a lot of people that don't really think on, on, on those time scales or in those terms. So we'll review um, basically what a glacial interglacial cycle is. And then I'll talk a little bit about the project itself, the Swace 2C project, where we plan to drill back in time, recover sediment from beneath the ice shelf um, to, to give us some insight into what our future may hold. Before I go too much further, I do want to acknowledge and, and highlight that this, of course, is a, is a massive team effort. All of the work I'm presenting um, is, is a team effort and particularly wanted to acknowledge um, some of the other PIs in Project One, Hugh Horgan, um, Christina Holber, Nick Gollage and, and the program leader, Tim Nash. Right, motivation, why do we care about the past? Um, well, this is sort of a, a summary of, of, of the real motivation for the whole platform really as a whole. Um, as we all, many of us are aware, most of us know now, I think, um, that the Paris Agreement signed in 2015 um, aims to keep warming, uh, future warming below or one point to, to 1.5 degrees if possible, but certainly below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. This is a, a global initiative, a global need. There's little doubt that uh, warming above two degrees becomes dangerous for humanity. So as, as we're well aware, we've, we've all agreed that most countries of the world have agreed to try to mitigate uh, emissions and keep temperature below two degrees. And um, so what we're really trying to do in, in the platform is, is figure out how Antarctica will respond to that amount of warming, that 1.5 to 2 degrees C, what might we expect to happen if we manage to keep emissions low and keep below that 2 degree threshold? We know there will be some change, but what sort of what might that change actually entail? Um, this little thermometer here that I'm showing, I think highlights the challenge we face. Um, it's uh, showing uh, obviously a thermometer, um, zero degrees uh, is, is essentially from pre-industrial times. And we're trying to keep temperature below two degrees warming above that pre-industrial level. Right now, we're sort of hovering around the one degree C above, above pre-industrial levels. So we've got a little bit of room to move um, if we want to achieve the, the, the real goal of the Paris Agreement, and that's to keep it um, at or below 1.5. And we've got a little bit of headspace to keep it below two. But if we start to think about what that means as geologists, we start to think about what one to two degrees means in terms of um, previous Earth behavior. We, we can look back to times in the past. Um, the last interglacial period I'll talk a lot about today, 125,000 years ago, temperature was about one to one and a half degrees warmer than pre-industrial. So it's a, it's a nice temperature analog for, uh, for, for Paris. 
And then if you go above that and beyond, you start to go further back in time to, to warmer intervals. And so really that's our motivation is what can we learn from the past to help inform us as to how Antarctica may respond to a Paris world. Um, the other motivation for us, of course, is trying to understand specifically what the, uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet will do. And there's a whole bunch of reasons to focus on the West Antarctic ice sheet. And this is this diagram, I think, su summarizes it, encapsulates it well. Um, West Antarctica is a marine-based ice sheet, as are large portions of East Antarctica, but West Antarctica is certainly a marine-based ice sheet, and it's vulnerable um, to, to a warming ocean. Um, the, the plots uh, on the slide show bed map that I'm sure many of you have seen before, but this is, this is a, an image of what Antarctica would look like if we removed the, the ice. And there are large portions in blue that are that are actually sitting below sea level. So these are the marine, the portions of marine-based ice sheet today, where the ice sheet's actually ground, grounded below sea level and and vulnerable to to a warming ocean interacting with the ocean directly. The ice sitting uh, above sea level on land is less um, susceptible, obviously, to that to that ocean warming. And one of the reasons we're really concerned about the interaction between the ocean and the ice sheets is is encapsulated in this diagram here, this little block diagram, um, showing how ocean heat comes up onto the continental shelf and starts to actually melt the marine-based ice. It doesn't have to warm very much to have a, a relatively significant effect, and you start to get retreat of these marine-based ice sheets um, due to melt. And, but as that retreat occurs, because of the shape or the, or the slope of the um, bed that the ice sheet sits on, it, it's actually a retrograde slope, slopes inland. And so ice dynamic processes start to um, take over and you get a little bit of a melt, a little bit of a nudge, and then the retreat, um, the dynamics themselves start to drive the retreat, um, um, to continue the retreat. So even if you stop the warming, you're still going to get um, retreat of these marine-based ice sheets. And this diagram here I, I found when I was putting this talk together, it's, it was quite stunning um, to me, just showing what's happening over the instrumental record of, of, of what we know is happening um, to uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet today well, and the whole Antarctic ice sheet as a whole. And this is a record of um, showing mass loss from the GRACE satellite, showing a decrease in mass overall of the Antarctic ice sheet, but that most of it is happening around, and this is the difference between um, 2004 and 2016, and you can see that the mass loss is in, in increasing, and that's of course um, reason to be concerned. We're primarily motivated in project one to look at, um, to try to figure out what happened to Antarctica's marine-based ice sheets the last time temperatures were 1.5 to 2 degrees C above pre-industrial. Now, we're not the first to think about this, and, I, and I've sort of, there's a little bit of a history lesson here, but it's quite, quite fascinating. Um, John Mercer, famous paper, um, certainly very famous now, back in the day, um, he struggled to get this published, and, and apparently Nature was one of the only journals that, that was um, prepared to, to push this story forward. Um, he published this paper explaining how with the West Antarctic ice sheet was at risk of, of uh, retreating, of collapsing if we kept putting greenhouse gas into the atmosphere and kept warming the climate. And you know, he's talking about things like um, the ice sheet itself, um, the ice shelves were collapsing, and then as a result, all of the grounded ice below sea level would deglaciate. So these are, he had recognized this problem back in the 70s um, and 60s. And he also noticed, not acknowledged that if we look back in time to the last interglacial period, um, it appears that evidence suggested, or certainly the evidence suggested even back then, that um, it was a warmer interval and that during that time sea levels were higher and it was likely that the, um, that the ice sheet had, had retreated. So the, these ideas have been floating around, excuse the pun, for, for, for quite some time. Now just to, again, frame glacial interglacial cycles and, and put them into some context, I apologize for those of you that know this, but, um, but just bear with me. Um, a lot of, the, you go out and talk to the uh, members of the public and they understand about ice ages. Uh, you know, there are certainly plenty of movies that we've all seen over the years um, indicating that there were large ice sheets on earth at some time in the past and that those ice sheets have, uh, have retreated and, and we now live in a, in a time where those ice sheets um, over, over the Northern Hemisphere in particular don't exist. Um, and, and that's in fact true, 20,000 years ago, there were large ice sheets on Earth, the last glacial maximum. And this is a reconstruction showing the distribution of ice over the Northern Hemisphere um, to about 20,000 years ago. And then climate warmed and those ice sheets retreated and now we're left in the Northern Hemisphere with uh, essentially with the ice sheet on, on Greenland. 
And today we live in our interglacial, the Holocene. The last 10,000 years has been a relatively warm period of time where humans have um, flourished and civilization has grown um, from 25,000 BC when the pyramids were being built um, all the way up to today where we're flying all sorts of amazing satellites um, around orbiting the earth, measuring the changes in mass of our ice sheets um, in response to climate change. So the Holocene is our interglacial and then 20,000 years ago we were in the last glacial maximum. Now the last glacial maximum is is uh, sorry the, the previous interglacial. So prior to the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, if you go back 100,000 years, we were in the previous interglacial. So the interglacial that was before the Holocene, the one in which we live. 125,000 years ago, it's quite a remarkable time. Temperatures from what we can tell from all of the reconstruction work that's been done um, across the globe, average global temperatures were one to maybe 1.5 degrees warmer than pre-industrial. So an analog in terms of temperature for, for sure for the for now and into the very uh, into the coming decades and, and certainly within that par, uh, Paris target. What's also very interesting about the um, last interglacial, interglacial is that sea level, uh, lots of people have been working reconstructing the sea levels that occurred during that last interglacial, sea level was anywhere between six and nine meters higher than today, than, than pre-industrial. And this is just an example of some of the, the data sets that we use to reconstruct, um, or that scientists use to reconstruct um, sea level back 125,000 years ago. This is uh, an image from a location in Sardinia in the Mediterranean, where tectonics are relatively stable in this particular location. And this is a, a record of um, the, the, where sea level once was, was 125,000 years ago, sea level was up, up here, nine meters higher than today. This is the notch that the sea level cut in these cliffs. Just as it's cutting a, a modern notch, this is the notch that was cut 125,000 years ago, indicating sea level, at least in this region, was nine meters higher than present. So, so where did all the water come from? That, that's a big question. Did it come from, from Greenland or did it come from West Antarctica or a combination of both? And if temperatures were one to 1.5 degrees warmer than pre-industrial, it suggests that these ice sheets are highly sensitive to relatively small increases in temperature. Did West Antarctica disappear? Did it contribute to this, um, this increase in sea level 125,000 years ago? This is a question we've all been focused on and are focused on in the current, um, current Antarctic Ice Dynamics project. But there were hints that this was the case that came out of work from colleagues of ours in the mid 1990s to late 1990s, Reid Shearer and Slavik Tulicek, two um, US scientists whom still work with us uh, today, uh, published a paper where they'd recovered some marine sediments or some sediments from beneath the present West Antarctic ice sheet. They'd melted a hole through where the ice sheet is grounded and they recovered some sediment from that location. And Reid Shearer found diatoms in those sediments that suggested marine conditions must have existed in order for those marine algae to flourish um, at the time, settle out to the seafloor and then be encapsulated in the sediment. And he argued that the age of some of these marine diatoms were late Pleistocene. So possibly last interglacial, but certainly some of the previous warm interglacial intervals suggesting that the West Antarctic ice sheet had disappeared. So little hints of evidence, but still just tantalizing, not really enough to, to convince us for sure that the West Antarctic ice sheet had collapsed during these warm previous interglacial periods. Now we completed a project um, in the mid to late 2000s um, where we drilled a hole through the Ross ice, uh, through the McMurdo ice shelf just off, off the coast of uh, Scott Base during the Andrew project and recovered this remarkable record of um, sediments, um, and this is a, a graphic representation of those sediments. Uh, the yellow colors represent um, sediments that are dominated by these marine algae, these marine algae that indicate the um, environment was open marine, not, not very little ice around if any. The green um, colored boxes are sediments that indicate ice was actually sitting over the drill site grounded at the drill site and depositing subglacial sediments. So this record of glacial interglacial, glacial interglacial, back going, going back uh, 5 million years. This was remarkable, a time of the, in, during the Pliocene when carbon dioxide levels were 400 parts per million, suggesting that the ice sheet, uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet had, in, had collapsed in fact and, and stayed removed or, or retreated for extended periods of time. The diatoms themselves also indicate that the temperatures of the, of the water were up to four degrees. 
centigrade, so significantly warmer than today. But this is under relatively high CO2 conditions. If we come up through the record into the Pleistocene, through those more recent glacial interglacial cycles, there was tantalizing evidence that there was some amount of glacial retreat, but no clear indication that you had um, open marine conditions. And certainly very difficult to say whether you had open marine conditions all of the way um, into, into central um, West Antarctica. However, the models that we were run to look at that same interval suggested that at times West Antarctica did collapse. So all of these geological hints, but nothing from right in the middle of, of, of West Antarctica, a bit of a frustration. Now, um, again, thinking about the last interglacial, one of the big questions is sea level was, was high, um, six to nine meters. So where did, the, where did the water come from? Did it come from West Antarctica or Greenland? And there's a lot of modeling, uh, there've been a lot of modeling studies to, to interrogate this question. And here are just some examples, one from um, Dave Pollard and, and Rob DeConto, um, published a few years back now, showing how um, different physics incorporated into the model could either produce um, retreat during the last interglacial of, of up to one meter from, from Antarctica, or potentially as much as over seven meters from, from, West, uh, from Antarctica. Other models run under similar um, boundary conditions, similar, similar climate forcings, suggest that up to 4.4 metres came from West Antarctica during the last interglacial. Another model here, um, run by Nick Gollidge and, and colleagues, published last year, suggests that up to three metres came from West Antarctica. And interestingly here, you've still got a lot of ice sitting in the Ross Sea region. In fact, ice is still grounded at the Cypel Coast during the last interglacial. So there's a whole bunch of modeling simulations, modeling experiments that are, that are somewhat inconclusive. Which one's, which one's more right? Which one, and we need to know this because these models have different processes in them and we need to nail down these processes in order to, to be more confident in our future simulations, our future projections. Um, so, so figuring out which of these scenarios is more likely is, is pretty important. Um, the implications of course are if you've got 4.4 meters from Antarctica, three meters plus must have come from Greenland, vice versa, if you only had one meter from Antarctica, then much more came from Greenland. So, so this is something that we're trying to work out. Where did, the, where did the water come from? This is pretty important too, to figure out just how sensitive West Antarctica, Antarctica is versus Greenland under a one to 1.5 plus um, degree warming. And this diagram here tries to show you, um, tries to touch on why. This is a diagram showing how sea level changes um, as ice sheets retreat and the sea level change is not uniform. So as an ice sheet retreats, if the West Antarctic ice sheet retreats more than Greenland, then sea level near to, near to Antarctica will actually fall. So in, in, uh, the sea level around Scott Base will actually fall next to the ice sheet, but the sea level rise in the far field will be amplified. So places in the far north, northern, northern hemisphere, but also in the Pacific will, will feel more sea level than, than the global average. So sorting this out is important. Um, this slide essentially says the same, uh, shows the same story. Um, and so I'm just gonna skip through this quickly. But the, the basic message is figuring out where the ice came from, which ice sheet might melt more than the other is super important because it has large implications for people living in different locations around the world. Right, drilling through the ice shelf, the project that we're actually going to, going to try to do to, to try to get these records from central West Antarctica to figure out whether or not it, the, the, the West Antarctic ice sheet did um, disintegrate during the last interglacial and previous warmer interglacials, or whether you have to warm climate um, all the way beyond two degrees to, to, to time intervals like the Pliocene before you get that full, uh, full deglacial state in, in West Antarctica. An international project involving a whole bunch of different people we're trying to pull together now. The plan is to, to traverse um, from Scott Base all the way out to the Cypel Coast and drill one site at the Cam Ice Stream and one site at the Creary Ice Rise. This is a diagram just show, sort of showing how the, the technology will work. What we plan to do is put a, um, put a small drill rig on the top of the ice shelf near the grounding zone of the, of the West Antarctic ice sheet, melt a hole through the ice with the Victoria University hot water drill and then drill down into the sediment to recover the records from beneath this location that will tell us whether the ice sheet was present, present or gone in the past. The drill rig itself is currently being built. Um, the build is being led by Alex Pine and Darcy Mandino, um, supported from the Antarctic Science Platform and Genius Science and, and the Victoria, and Victoria University. And this is just a picture to show you 
the, the rig that we're trying to get, it's a, it's a fairly small rig, and this is the rig on the factory floor in Canada uh, currently being built. So, so it's all coming together um, slowly but surely, even, even in a COVID-strained world. We will get out to the drill site using Traverse, um, but also the aircraft and airframes supported through Antarctica New Zealand, so a, a big logistical operation to get out there. Utilize the same sort of um, camp um, infrastructure that's been successfully deployed twice now um, through the platform and through the Inzari supported Ross Ice Shelf project. Um, and so this is the, it's all proven approach, proven technology, amazing amount of awesome work done by Antarctica New Zealand uh, to, to get us out there so far. And we'll just piggyback off that same approach um, when we want to actually do the sediment coring. Site survey work that's been supported up to this point um, through the Ross Ice Shelf project and the past Antarctic Climates Program, um, MB support, Antarctica New Zealand support, gravity surveying that was done last year um, on the ice shelf, and also seismic surveys that were done last year to try to characterize the drill site so we actually know what we're drilling into. Super important work and, we, and we've, we've got some really fantastic data. Um, so thanks to the team that was deployed last year, um, Andrew Gorman and, and others, um, collecting those critical data that will allow us to drill um, at, at the, and recover the records from these previous warm times. Just to sort of finish up here, just to show you some of the um, site survey data, uh, Gavin Dunbar and team were able to collect some sediment core that shows that there are soft sediments beneath the site, so we're not going to drill um, straight into basement, which is always a good, good sign. Um, these are some of the seismic data. There's a regional disconformity, a surface that can be mapped all the way to the Willens Ice Stream um, that has quite, de separates quite distinct packages of sediment. And our interpretation at, at this point is that the stuff on top, the softest stuff on top is Pleistocene, containing some of these warm interglacial periods that may or may not indicate the ice sheet retreated. It may actually show that the ice sheet stayed and that the model that Nick Gollidge and others have run for the last interglacial is more likely than the model that um, Rob DeConto and others have run. And then the intention would be to drill through this reflected D back into the Pliocene and possibly late Miocene sediments to get back into those even warmer worlds, those worlds that we will be heading into if we miss the Paris target. Right. Now that's, that's essentially where I wanted to finish up my, my talk and I'm, I'm cognizant of time, but let, if you can just bear with me, just humor me for a few more minutes because I was, I was thinking about um, the, the paper that, uh, that John Mercer wrote and just pondering, um, you know, what the last interglacial means for us. And, you know, while we are trying to drill into the, into the um, sediments to try to better understand how the ice sheet will respond to these 1.52 degrees, two degree worlds, um, carbon dioxide continues to go up. So, um, you know, John Mercer in 1978 um, warned us, it's now 42 years later since he, since he published that paper, we're still planning to drill beneath the ice shelf, but we need to just crack on um, with mitigating and reducing our emissions because th this diagram sort of highlighted to me the, the, the real issue. This is, this is um, carbon dioxide reconstructions from the Epica ice core from the last interglacial 125,000 years ago. Sea level nine meters higher than present and temperatures one to 1.5 degrees warmer than present. Then it's dropped down into the, the, the last glacial, the last glacial maximum. Then it took 7,000 years for CO2 to climb about 90 parts per million back to 2000 years ago. And it's been relatively flat um, since sort of the, the Holocene all the way through the last 2000 years until we get to 1850. So this is the onset of the, of the um, last glacial maximum, uh, sorry, the, the onset of the, uh, of the industrial revolution. And then we've got the, the direct measurements from Mauna Loa showing that we've, we've gone, uh, CO2 has climbed by 80 parts per million in the 42 years since John Mercer published his paper saying that ice shelves were going to collapse and the West Antarctic ice sheet was going to retreat. The same amount of CO2 that essentially took 7,000 years um, for, for the Earth's natural processes to, to, to pump into the atmosphere. So this drilling project's awesome. We're going to learn more about the sensitivity of the West Antarctic ice sheet, but let's not forget the fact that we actually need to stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere now. Let's not wait another 42 years so that in 42 years time, people are saying thanks to the Antarctic Science Platform for showing us that the West Antarctic Ice Sheet um, 
uh, is highly sensitive to one to 1.5 degrees uh, of warming. So I'll get off my soapbox now and, and, and I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions. Thanks for your presentation, Richard. We definitely have a few questions coming through. Um, we'll get started with the first one. It's a massive project, that drilling project. So what does it take to get something like this off the ground? Yeah, this is, um, this is certainly not a one person, two person effort, <laughs> far from it. Uh, this, these sorts of projects require massive amounts of work and input from a whole range of people with different skill sets. Um, obviously there is the science community that has to pull together the thoughts, the ideas, write the proposals, think about what the, the question is we want to answer and, and how we might answer it. But then we've got teams of engineers designing the, the drill rigs. We've got logistics planners working at Antarctica New Zealand, helping us pull, pull all of the different um, activities required to get us out into the field. We've got people who will be science support once we recover the core, working back at the universities who are going to provide some of the technical technical um, information to help us do our science, generate the data. We've got administrators, we've got project managers, we've got science communicators. Um, it's just a whole whole massive team of people that are really required to, to pull these sorts of projects off. And then we've got our international partners working with people from all around the world, speaking different languages, trying to um, communicate together to, to really pull this project together. So it's a massive undertaking, incredibly challenging, but at the same time, um, yeah, super, super fascinating and very rewarding. So yeah, hats off to all of those that, that help us. Yeah, brilliant. And so um, anyone who's not involved, um, who, who might not be attached to the research community that's watching, what can they do to help? How can they be involved or how can they do their part? Do their part in, in helping with the project or is it helping, you know, I mean, so the last slide, I guess, um, highlights to me what we can all do and that's keep the pressure on our government, international governments, ourselves, to mitigate CO2, because we, we, we want to stop that. That's first and foremost. Um, mitigate CO2 emissions, keep that political pressure, keep telling the story. Um, don't let, um, I guess we, we, we're at risk of becoming slightly distracted by other, other issues that we're facing at the moment, but we can't let the, the climate issue um, sort of fall off the radar and, um, and become another story become another frustration as, as I'm sure John Mercer was. So that's one thing. Um, but in terms of getting directly involved in our project or promoting, I guess, promoting the message, um, telling friends, family, whanau, um, whomever you can about the project, what, why we're doing what we're doing. We've got some um, promotional information that we've tried to uh, prepare for a general audience. We're happy to distribute that, let people know the amazing things that New Zealand is doing and New Zealand is leading in terms of this Antarctic research project. In terms of getting actually involved with uh, the project itself, I mean, we're always keen and willing to hear from anyone. So if someone's got some thoughts or questions or interests, um, yeah, just e e send us an email. Brilliant. And yeah, um, also pop onto the website and there's all sorts of contact details. And if you have a specific researcher you wanna to talk to, you can always email me and I'll connect you directly with them as well. Um, another sort of research specific question, so why was the Kareri Ice Rise chosen as a drill site? Yeah, good question. So this is, um, this is an area where ice dynamics, are, I guess, are the primary driver. And we've been partnering with our colleagues in the US um, to develop this particular project. So it's the, the, the international component, New Zealand's sort of focus and leadership is on the CAM ice stream, and we're partnering with the US around the Kareri Ice Rise, part, in, in part because they're wanting to understand glacial dynamics, when, when, when did the ice rise lift off in the past or did it? And, and has it touched down? When did it touch down? What sort of effect or control do those pinning points have on, on glacial dynamics? Is something they want to get to the base of the ice sheet at the Kareri Ice Rise to start to address those questions. But if we drill down deeper, there's also the seismic data show these beautifully dipping strata that we think are late Miocene and older in age. So there's an opportunity for us to look at late Pleistocene Pliocene conditions at Cam Ice Stream, but then extend the record back further in time to look at even warmer intervals to try to see how the uh, the Antarctic environment uh, responded. So it's a sort of it's a stratigraphic stacking, if if you like, building a composite record of the history of West Antarctica in this region 
as well as trying to understand modern glacial dynamics, when I say modern, over the last sort of several hundred thousand years. And um, with the um, delays this season, your project's still up and running, still on time? Yes, um, it is. It is. In fact, we, we took the, I guess we almost took COVID as being a bit of a positive for us because we were really pushing hard um, to meet the deadlines to make sure we could get the drill rig built to be shipped to Antarctica on time. We always build in um, contingencies for weather when we plan these big projects. So we, we'd always sort of had up our sleeve, we could delay 12 months and it wouldn't really affect our, our, our science. Um, and so what, what COVID's really done is sort of almost taken the pressure off to, to be able to do it this year. Uh, sorry, to do it on, on the timeline we had and we've shifted everything by 12 months. So it gives us an additional 12, month of, uh, 12 months to plan, to build, to, to make sure we've got all of our ducks in a row. Of course, the cost, the risk now we, we have to acknowledge is that if we get a subsequent delay because of weather or if COVID continues, then it starts to squeeze us a little bit more. So fingers crossed the world um, gets, gets things sorted with respect to the pandemic not obviously for our project alone, um, for, for many other much more important reasons, but, but um, certainly COVID hasn't really impacted us yet, which is, which is good. Okay, thank you for your answers today, Richard. That's unfortunately all we've got time for. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you for going through that. That was a super interesting presentation. and Also really great to link um, John Mercer's research into what you're doing today. I'd also like to thank everyone who attended and joined our webinar, um, same place, same time next week. And we'll update the platform page this afternoon with all the links in this talk has been recorded. So if you have colleagues or friends or family who'd like to have a look but couldn't join us today, then you can share the link with them too. Great. Thank you. Thanks.